You are listening to the Overwatch League Network, the podcast with Deadeye on all the Overwatch League news and information, the show with Tactical Visor on the statistics and analysis. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk, Spider, and Slambo. What is up, guys, and welcome back to Overwatch League Network, the podcast with a dead eye on all the latest Overwatch League news, information, and esports analysis. I am your host, Simply Drunk, and tonight on episode 98, we will be discussing the latest news of it, the Overwatch League, and of course, we've got to take a look back at the 2019 Overwatch League Grand Finals that took place over this past weekend. But before we can get into the news and introduce you to my co-host, let me just quickly take a moment to thank everyone who is joining us tonight on Twitch for our live show, and of course thank all of our repeat listeners out there. So joining me tonight, as always, is my co-host Spider, and Spider, it's been a bit of a week, you know, we had the Grand Finals, uh, they came, they went, uh, if you blinked, you might have missed it. Shaw kinda kinda continued to run, did some things. Uh Titans made some kind of oddball decisions in regards to map choices, which we'll definitely get into. But today we saw like the first sign in window open. There's been a bit of movement, so we've had uh, quite a busy week across the board. But how has the past week been treating you? I mean, obviously the the big thing that I'm gonna talk about is the grand finals. I mean, I was there, I got to see the stomp live unfortunately it was like the the worst case scenario going in drive you know two hours to see four maps but uh the outside stuff was was really fun like they had like the fan fest before Mm -hmm. uh you know before the game started and that was a lot of fun like um i'll probably post some videos and stuff on twitter later or maybe tomorrow i just didn't get around to it today because i had a lot of work stuff to catch up on um but they had like you know the 360 camera, the payload camera, um, that you've probably seen videos of, they had like, uh, jump like tracer. So they would take your picture and it it would look like you're, uh, blinking. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, you could walk out of the, um, like the doors that are kind of like the doors that they would walk out of on blizzard arena, uh, with the pyrotechnics and everything music. So you could do like Mm -hmm. your own overwatch intro. So, I'll probably post the videos of that stuff on there. That was a lot of fun. FanFest overall was a lot of fun. You could kind of run in and, you you know, like run into some of the, um, not really players. Like the only player that really showed up there was uh, Jonak and Stratus. Uh, And Jonak was like exclusively in like the T-Mobile tent. Like he was just taking Mm -hmm. pictures with the MVP trophy because I don't think he wanted to give it away. Um, so that was kind of funny. And then Stratus was just kind of incognito around. Uh, and I heard sure for was the same way. Like he was walking around in like a hoodie and like sunglasses and stuff. Uh, but other than that, like ran into like Stylosa, like all the, you know, the YouTube personalities, stuff like that. Uh, but fan fest was just a lot of fun. Like everybody having fun celebrating overwatch. So that was really cool. And then, um, you know, then we, we got in, we got in line uh, to get in, uh, and then we, we actually got in uh, to see, like, a lot of the pre-show. We got to see, like, the desk set up and stuff, so that was that was really cool. Uh, all in all, like, you know, without getting into the actual game, because we're going to do that later, all the pre-show stuff, like the venue, everything, like, everything was really great. Um, didn't have any traffic getting in because we, we, we got there early. Uh, we had parking spots reserved. Uh, I used like Spot Hero and got parking, like a, basically a parking spot right next to the exit. So when we wanted nice. to leave, uh, we could just leave and go get our Philly cheesesteak like right away, which is absolutely what we did. And it was hilarious because as soon as we got there, uh, like 400 other Overwatch fans got there too. So uh, <laughs> they came right from the game and got their, their Philly cheesesteak. Um, we went to Tony Luke's. Um, we were going to go to Delisandro's, which is like the the big one, like Geno's, Jim's, and Delisandro's are like the three big ones everybody recommends. Um, but we didn't feel like waiting in line that long. So we 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 looked up like the the fourth best, and that was <laughs> Tony Luke's. Uh, and I have to say it was phenomenal. Uh, so if you're if you're in the area, do that. But 
uh, of course like there there was a there was a match mm -hmm. uh, it was a very quick match uh not as lopsided as the 4-0 score leads you to believe but we'll get into that but we'll like what about you? How was how was the viewing experience? Because in the arena there was a little bit of a technical like technical difficulties like yeah, switching about, back like, and the, forth. There were issues with like dead pixels on on the monitors too. It, I didn't notice that too much, but like their transitions were really rough. Like it, it seemed like they 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 were juggling multiple broadcasts, of course, because they had like the Twitch, they had the arena, and then they had the ABC broadcast. Um, so it, it seemed like there was some like crossed wires here and there um, yeah. during the actual Overwatch uh, game, but like the actual like concert and stuff like that, everything else seemed really well. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't notice any dead pixels. I, I did notice a few audio hiccups and like I said, the transitions were a little rough. Um, but I don't know if you guys caught that on the stream. Like how was how was like the stream performance? Uh, the stream ran pretty good. Uh, I will note that I tried to watch it on my TV, uh, but for some reason, ABC was airing the Cubs game against the Cardinals, even though it's kind of a moot point. Yes, it's a rivalry game, but we were already knocked out of the wild card running. Uh, and I didn't bother to see if there was another ABC affiliate that it was airing on in the Chicago area. So I did watch on Twitch. Uh, I was hanging out, you know, in, in Discord and all that good stuff. Uh, but man, I just, I hate, you know, when people show up for, you know, a Zed concert and then for Overwatch happens, you know. I know. All right. Two two Zed's credits. Zed's the Zed concert was really good. Like I wasn't there for the DJ Khaled debacle of 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, I just watched it on Twitch. Um, but the person that I went with, he said that this is way better than DJ Khaled. Like the the like energy in the arena was much better. Like the involvement was much better. Mm -hmm. um, and he he said like on the the stream, it it looked like uh, he he was getting like reports from like Discord and stuff that. Uh, it didn't look like the crowd was into it, but the crowd was very into the Zed concert. I, I feel like part of that was just the fact that most of the, the mic is just directed towards the stage. Like, I don't think you could really hear the audience. So, like, uh, it was okay. just a bad uh, a bad uh, viewpoint based off of that alone. Okay. So it was really hard to pick up the actual audience noise. Uh, but the concert ran pretty good. I was I was pretty happy with that overall. Uh, mm -hmm. really no complaints on that end, and I did like some of the Overwatch visuals. Granted, you know, we, we got kind of like something else that we'll talk about in regards to the Zed concert here in just a little bit. Yep. But let's talk about what has happened in this past week, and then of course we will wrap up with our grand finals post-game discussion. So for starters, we have an update on the Shane High Dragons, who, as we talked about last week, made a couple of coaching changes with the release of their head coach, Blue House, as well as their assistant coach, Levi. Uh, so we now know who is going to be filling that head coach position on the Dragons for the 2020 season. And they have turned to a former LA Valiant head coach, uh, that being Moon, who most recently has been the head coach for the Shanghai Dragons Academy team over in Contenders China, that being none other than Team CC. Now, Moon, you know, he started with the Valiant back in the 2018 season. Uh, he stayed with the team all the way through the first stage of the 2019 season, which unfortunately was the 0-7 start for the LA Valiant. Uh, and, you know, after that he was released and then he uh, basically, like, his tenure with the Valiant was like a 20-17 and record across the two seasons uh, when he was their head coach. Now, since then, he joined Team CC, and that was back in June, and, you know, with the Dragons Academy team, they did pretty well. They finished in second place in Season 2 of 2019 in Contenders China, uh, only having lost in the Grand Finals to LGE Hua, so pretty good run with them, and, you know, the Dragons to stay in-house, they promote one of their coaches, and, you know, this is a team that basically went from, you know, going to 0-40 to finishing with a 13-15 and record in Season 2. You know, they are the last stage champions, having won Stage 3, so uh, a pretty, pretty deep uh, drop-off in Stage 4 with the introduction of 2-2-2. Uh, but, you know, they did make it into the second round of the play-in tournament, uh, which... You know, it was a pretty 
pretty unrealistic expectation kind of like going in a lot of people weren't weren't sure like how the full reset would do but you know they made a run at it at the end of the day and right now you have the Dragons coaching staff that just consists of Moon, and they have one assistant coach left on that roster, that being none other than Creed. So we got a little bit of a redemption arc potential in regards to Moon. Uh, but I'm just, I'm always happy to see when the org stay in-house for things like this. You know, it, it, it helps build reputation on your organization, and you know... We'll, uh, we'll see how Moon is going to do in his second run, but I know, you know, last week there was a lot of talk about, like, was this change really needed after, you know, the turnaround story that we had with the Dragons, and, you know, with such the, the drastic changes that we saw from Stage 3, where they won, you know, the title to Stage 4, and them having things kind of, like, be a free-fall state, I feel like it absolutely was needed at this time, and we'll see what Moon's going to be able to do moving forward with the dragons yeah it's kind of it's kind of like what i said last week like they they wouldn't jettison their coaching staff if they didn't already have a plan in place and it, it seems like moon was that plan like I, I i can't think that they they didn't get rid of their coaches without knowing that they were going to promote moon mm -hmm. um and you know moon i think might do better in shanghai like he did very well in you know la valiant uh, up until stage one when he had the big brain decision to take out big brain Custa. Um, obviously, there was some other stuff going on in the Valiant, and he just wasn't happy there. Valiant wasn't happy with him. So, uh, you know, he, he moved on, and I, I think he'll do better in Shanghai just because I think he'll do better with a mostly Korean roster because that seemed to be his focus in the L.A. Um, from what we've heard. So I, I think this is a good fit. It is kind of sad that the the coaching staff that did kind of turn the team around um was jettisoned but basically they can go and get a job with pretty much any team that has you know korean players or a korean focus pretty easily um so you know seoul i think is is pretty good on coaches but there are a lot of other teams that might be looking for coaches like we have um you know washington isn't primarily korean but they could use coaches now because uh they got rid of their coaching staff like literally uh, everyone <laughs> like everyone um so washington's looking for coaches i'm sure we're gonna get a lot more news over the coming weeks so i wouldn't feel too bad about the shanghai coaches going um but it is you know I am curious to see how Moon does, but uh, they've got a very talented roster, so maybe he's the right coach for the right team because great coaches have done horrible with, you know, great teams. Uh, it's just, you know, coaching mentality and uh, all that jazz that we've talked about in the past, like teams clicking together. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess Shanghai thinks this is the right choice, and I can't really fault them for it because after their initial season, they've been on an upward trajectory. So, you know, let's see how far Moon can take them. Well, I mean, they were either going to level out or they were to have a little bit of momentum. And sure enough, it was a little bit of both <laughs> in this case. Uh, so we'll see how the Dragons do going into the 2020 season. Uh, but... You know, it was a busy week in Philadelphia. Not only did they host the Grand Finals, but we also uh, got our first look at the new Fusion Arena, uh, which is not set to open its doors until 2021. Uh, so basically, they, they broke grounds on this $50 million esports arena, uh, which is going to feature, like, a team store. They have an arena theater. Uh, they got something called the Iron Market. I couldn't really find too much info on what exactly that's going to be. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I like that, you know, they kept it with the actual branded in regards to the name, which is always nice to see. Uh, but it looks like this venue is going to seat up to 3,500 spectators. And, of course, you know, they'll have a dedicated training center. Uh, you know, the team offices will be there. they got a broadcast studio, so I'm sure they'll do a lot of stuff in-house. Uh, rather than, you know, doing a whole, like, mansion-type thing that they've been doing in the past. Uh, so... You know, I know they're going to have, like, balcony bars, they got club seats, uh, with, of course, USB ports, because everyone needs to charge their phones when they're taking tons of photos, all that good stuff. Uh, but it looks like they'll have some suites as well, so curious to see how much those are going to cost at, at an esports arena. See if that's comparable to just, like, normal venues. Uh, but, you know, they're expected to create 
you know, up, upwards of like 500 jobs with all the construction going on with this. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're projecting this to make Philadelphia $1 million in economic benefits in its first year alone. Uh, but looking at next year, of course, you know, Philly are hosting two homestands, both of which will take place. Uh, the first one being at the Met Philadelphia, and then the second one is at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City. But, you know, it's a, a peer into the future of uh, what is to come up for Philadelphia. And, you know, not not every team out there is going to have that, that Comcast money to, like, go out and custom design a venue. Uh, but, you know, it's important to note, like, things like this aren't just going to be specifically utilized just for esports. Of course, we'll hold other events here as well. Uh, but... You know, we'll we'll see how many how many teams out there are gonna pony up and uh, go this route. It'll be it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean that that was my takeaway is uh, you know, not every team like you said is gonna have Comcast money, but there are a lot of teams that do uh, more than you would think. Like just off the top of my head, San Francisco Shock do. Uh, obviously, they are looking to get a big investment after uh, you know the past season. Mm -hmm. Seoul do. Um, because they're the primary Korea team and they have a lot of sponsors. Uh, and Atlanta does because they're owned by a rival cable company. And, you know, as much as the cable companies like to screw us, uh, they definitely don't want to stand back and let another cable company take them out. Uh, so uh, Atlanta could possibly be the next one up. Like they, they would definitely be it. Um, then, you know, for talking like expansion teams, Vegas has a big esports arena coming, so it'd be very easy to slot a team in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these types of arenas, I think, are going to become more and more common uh, as the seasons go on. Like next season, obviously, we're probably not going to get any. Um, we're going to see a lot of these mixed venues like we're seeing even Philadelphia use next season. Um, but in terms of like the actual arena concept and... Um, like what we saw in the preview and all that stuff. It it basically looks like a bigger, more sportsy Blizzard arena. Like they basically took the the Blizzard arena idea and just amped it up. Like the 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 seating, the style, um, the layout, everything like that is exactly how the Blizzard arena was basically laid out. They just you know amplified it by ten, so they added you know three thousand you know whatever seats. So I, I think that's a good idea. I think you should kind of stick what you know works and then go from there. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. Like the more investments we see in the sport, the, you know, basically the safer it becomes. Um, and, you know, a lot of people kind of scoffed at like the 50 million <laughs> price tag. They're like, Oh my God, that's, that's insane. It, it's really not when you consider that some of these teams cost that just to play. Um, and this is something that's going to directly make them revenue back. Like you said, they, they projected about a hundred million in the first year, which was a high projection. Um, but they, they'll easily make that back within two years, like just from merchandising from food sales um, from, you know, whatever sponsorship. So it's, it's smart that the fusion are getting in on this at ground level. Um, it probably would have been a little easier for them had their team done a little better this year, but they were still technically, um, you know, a play in team. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they at least have that. So I, uh, you know, I can't, I can't fault teams that want to invest in the league. Yeah, so uh, for a team that was mildly mediocre, kind of like throughout the season, they still managed to weasel their way in. Mm hmm. Uh, but, anyways, so getting back to the grand finals really quick. Uh, you know, obviously, like the, the whole music thing was going to be a big thing. Uh, you know, you you would mention that, you know, Questlove was kind of doing some stuff kind of like in between the sets, which, you know, we never yeah. got to really see in regards to the Twitch broadcast. So. Uh, what exactly was he doing kind of like in between kind of like the, the lull moments, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, you guys got the the Zed performance, which was really good. But Questlove was like tearing it up in between um, maps, in between like breaks and stuff like that. Like he was playing multiple remixes of, you know, he did a lot of like retro remixes of um, 
like older video game music, uh, even popular songs. He would do like the the retro video game type remix, like he did like My Sharona, like in the bit tune and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like he was he was I was very impressed. Like he he definitely knew how to like work the crowd and stuff like that. And he it, the funniest thing is I don't know if you guys ever actually saw him on the broadcast. But he was there, and he looked like he was in, like, his pajamas, and he was in, like, a Blockbuster t-shirt. Um, <laughs> like, straight up, like, old Blockbuster video, um, like, hoodie t-shirt, Bill Belichick type deal. Yeah, you know, he, he, uh, that, that, is, that is retro at this point, you know, Blockbuster. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he was really good. Like, I, I was really impressed. He, he kept the crowd amped up. Like, he, he didn't talk over the mic that much, um, but he, he was putting down you know music kind of more of the music that i wish zed would have done like i wish zed would have might like mixed in some of the overwatch music yeah we, um, we didn't get the the zelda melody that i posted on our discord that he did yeah i mean i, I wouldn't expect them to drop some nintendo no. music unless they were really pushing the unless Switch. that unless that smash crossover was actually coming you know yeah I mean, they did. They did give away, or they're they're still giving away like a Switch bundle. Mm-hmm. So it, it's possible. Um, but yeah, in terms of like Questlove, he, his music was was great. Like it was the perfect like in between like chill music, and um, I'm sure he made a, a buttload of money for DJing. What was essentially what like half an hour, <laughs> if that. Since yeah, so. in between stuff. That's awesome. But, yeah, it, it, I I was impressed with all the musical stuff. Like even the the DJ they had outside, um, everything was was really good. Yeah, that being uh, Mark and Garrix. Uh, well, that was the night before, but they had okay. another DJ outside at the fan fest. Um, same type of thing. Same Might have been ED. DJ Ghost. I think that was the other. Yeah, one. Ghost was, was and he was. He was really good, like, and he he worked the mic really well. But in terms of the actual arena, like, I was impressed with pretty much everything that they did in between. Like, um, I I'm sad you guys probably didn't get like the Golden Boy experience because like every time there was a break, like Golden Boy was there talking on the mic, like doing mm-hmm. stuff. Like they had like games and stuff. Um, they at one point in between maps, uh, Jeff Kaplan came out, which I'm sure you guys saw some of that. But they were like talking here and there, and there's like pictures on Reddit where Jeff Kaplan's like um, climbing over seats to get pictures with people, which actually was like right about there on my picture, mm-hmm. um, and that was really cool. But what they did is um, they had like the QR code that you guys could scan and download, like the digital right. prints. Um, if you if you actually went and you got like the upgrade package, you actually got like the physical prints, um, but they actually gave away like limited edition Jeff Kaplan versions of these. They were like <laughs> Jeff Kaplan trading cards and they literally dropped them from the top of the arena in like little parachutes because Jeff's like, let it rain. <laughs> and then it was hilarious, but um, that was really cool. So like all the in-between stuff was fun. Um, you know, Questlove was great. Zed was great. So mm-hmm. I, I, I have no complaints. Like there was no DJ Khaled debacle. No. Thank goodness we couldn't have another one of those on our hands. Uh, but you know, during Zed's performance, uh, in the opening ceremony, uh, they they kind of like briefly flashed like this Widowmaker skin on screen during this concert. Uh, which is like pink and blue. Of course, if it's like Zed's name and his logo on on the gun itself, and you know. <sighs> I, I don't know if, like, this is just, like, a one-off type thing specifically just done for the Grand Finals for the event, or if this is something that maybe they're actually going to look at putting into the game. Because uh, right now, when you kind of, like, look at the specialty skins, primarily what we've been seeing is, like, commemorative players in Overwatch League teams, whether it's MVP uh, or, you know, winning the championship. Uh, but, you know, if they do something like this, it would really be, you know, its first... Uh, you know, the first of its kind, uh, but, you know, for for how quickly, like, it was up and then gone, I'm not expecting this to get put into the game, but I, I thought it was pretty nice just to have something unique just specifically for the event at that time. Uh, 
we, we never got like any sort of you know zed bren 1v1 which a lot of people were were figuring was going to happen uh but you know it was it was just a nice touch to really fit in because you know outside of that you know of course we would have like the the overwatch logo at times during the performance but there really wasn't too much connecting the two but i will say i did like uh the uh incorporation of the pyrotechnics along with the performance Granted, some of the lighting at times could be uh, a bit much. I will say. Yeah, if you are uh, if you are epileptic, do not watch that pre-show. Holy cow, uh, that was rough. Like there, uh, my wife is, uh, even though she is not tick really like photo sensitive. I was still like, I'm not sending you those videos, mm -hmm. um, just in case. Uh, but yeah, the the pre-show was rough to watch at times um but it, it was very entertaining and the skin was very cool and i'm kind of with you i don't think we're gonna get this uh unless they do some kind of like event um to tide us over to uh halloween because the bastion event ends tomorrow they could easily throw this up there as like a even like a mini event like win three games get the zed Widowmaker skin just because it, it would if you look at it it would be like an epic skin it, it would definitely not be a legendary skin mm -hmm. um but on the other hand it could just be something that they made and gave to him for performing like if you run into somebody rocking a zed Widowmaker skin you probably know it's him um and you're probably dead because he's very very good at the game uh which is actually why we didn't get the bren zed 1v1 <laughs> like they they had they I, I'm pretty sure they said it on the desk um, because we heard it in the arena, but uh, they they touched on that. Like, he wanted that, and then they went into, like, the fake Lucio stats. Well, the Lucio versus... I love said, that. <laughs> that was really funny. Um, and that shows you, like, how how much, like, how genuine Zed was mm -hmm. because he, he legitimately was like, oh, yeah, I, I don't heal. Uh, that's right. that's not me. My uh, my favorite part of that though was like when they were doing like albums released. <laughs> so yeah, that is like oh, that is two and Lucio's one. <laughs> Lucio's catching up on me, so I better watch out. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's what I'm saying. Like he he just seemed like you know obviously he he likes Overwatch. He's invested in Overwatch, so I think you know this was a cool little touch giving him his own skin. Um, but I'm kind of with you. I I I don't expect it. It would be a nice surprise, um, but. I, I wouldn't hold your breath for it. Yeah, so while we did have some raining chance of Jeff anytime our Dev and Savior appeared on screen, uh, he, he did take a little bit of time in regards to some interviews, and, you know, there's something interesting that he noted that I do want to talk about, and uh, our, our Papa Jeff would like to eye in NHL tradition and bring it over to the Overwatch League. So uh, that tradition, in particular, in... Uh, revolves around the championship in itself uh and you know Kaplan is a pretty big hockey fan and he'd like to see every championship winning team and the players on that roster get their names engraved on the overwatch league trophy now while we we haven't heard any plans of this actually happening as of yet it would help build you know the prestige of the trophy in itself uh, so, you know, that, that could mean that, you know, maybe there'd be a redesign in order to make this happen if they decide to go that route. Uh, but, you know, who knows if that will happen or, like, if they'll just start from whatever time to introduce it and then, you know, engrave the names from that point on or if they'll go back and kind of do it. But, you know, what, what were your thoughts on, like, kind of adding a new tradition to the cup in itself be for, for something like this? I, I will preface this and say that I am not a huge hockey fan. Mm -hmm. Um definitely not like uh you know slambo was uh so i i i have no you know dog in this race but i actually really like that tradition from the stanley cup like engraving all the players names and stuff like that obviously the trophy would need a redesign um and they should absolutely add the first two champions retroactively but i do i do kind of like that because it, it does add a little bit of prestige to the the trophy um it's not like um the nfl trophy uh you, you get to see all the other people and you know you hand it off to the next person so you know it's like the same trophy uh so i, I do really like that and i do hope they eventually do that um and you know if 
Jeff has the amount of sway that we think he does. It could possibly happen. So I, I'm all for this. Like, I, I do really like this. Well, I mean, considering that Jeff got one of the biggest ovations at the Grand Finals. <laughs> that was amazing. Like, every time Jeff Kaplan came on the state, like, showed up, it the arena just erupted. Like, mm -hmm. it was just, Jeff, 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 Jeff. It, it, the best part was at the very end, which uh, I'm sure is the one you're referring to, where just the crowd is going nuts. You know, mm -hmm. San Francisco just won it. Uh, and Jeff and Pete come out. And it is like Pete just does not exist. It is <laughs> hilarious. Like everybody's like, shut up and just let Jeff talk. Like this, it was amazing. Now they don't want to hear from the commissioner. They want to hear from the game director, Jeff Kaplan. <laughs> uh, so moving on, as I mentioned at the start of the show, today was the uh, first important day in regards to signing Windows. So teams, as of now, can now exercise team options on existing players currently under contract. Uh, you know, they can go out, they can negotiate contract extensions with their talent. They can also sign and promote academy players from their respective academy teams. Uh, so, you know, kind of like looking at some of the, you know, important dates coming up here. The next big one is October 7th, where teams that have completed exercise in Existing contract options can submit free agent player contracts for league approval, and that's when, you know, player trades also open up for league approval. And then, you know, fast forward a bit to November 11th, and that is when the free agent uh, thing really opens up. So players not under contract by November 11th become free agents. But of course, we've already seen some changes happening already. Uh, it hasn't been... Uh, a ton of movement. I mean, it was kind of a mass exodus in regards to the Washington Justice coaching staff. But I feel like I, I don't think it's going to be like opening the floodgates. It's going to be a constant like trickle effect in regards to, you know, players and out in LFT or just looking for other options for trials and things like that. Uh, but the Justice wasted no time in starting anew with their coaching staff. So they're looking for that clean slate after finishing the 2019 season, tied for 17th place in the league. So gone, our head coach, Wizard Hyun. Gone is, you know, assistant coach Vala. They also got rid of MKL and their other assistant coach, Shrugger. And, you know, unfortunately for the Justice, this was one of those teams, one of the few who finished a stage 0-7. Uh, but, you know, they had a pretty big turnaround come... The introduction of 2-2-2 with two, two, two the league, and that was one of the things that made Stage 4 so exciting. Like, that would have been a completely different stage playoffs had, you know, there actually been stage playoffs and not a playing tournament. Uh, but they are looking ahead at the 2020 season, and, you know, right now, like, you know, DC has a lot of stuff going on. They are one of the few teams who are hosting five different home sand events next year. Uh, so we'll see how that's going to work out. Uh, but, you know, I know Ark was already posting that, you know, he's lft Now, that doesn't mean he's not going to be on the Justice, per se, but, you know, he is looking for other options out there. But, you know, looking at this, you know, they got rid of their Korean coaches, Ark is LFT. I mean, how safe can you really feel if you were on the Justice right now, outside of maybe their DPS line? I think you you have to feel okay as long as you're not on the the tank line um <laughs> for the justice i think most people are, are in including the justice probably are in agreement. that's one thing that needs to change mm -hmm. uh but i i think over the next week maybe two weeks possibly three weeks we're gonna see a lot of these type of texts we're not gonna see like a just straight up lft we're gonna see like you know so and so has allowed me to explore opportunities. Uh, so looking for tryouts or stuff like that, uh, and we may not even see that. Like there may be a lot of that going on behind the scenes um, because you you have to imagine that a lot of the higher profile season one veteran players are probably going to be like, look, you can explore opportunities, but uh, you know, do it a little bit under wraps. Like, you know, don't don't put it out there. Like, you know, somebody somebody that has a lot of popularity, like Surefor, right, mm -hmm. wouldn't put out. I I would doubt would put out a tweet like, 
looking for other opportunities to LFT because that's just going to cause a a huge S storm that you know the the PR especially Gladiators PR right now because they probably don't have a PR team at the very moment. Uh, well, that would be the second time Gladiators would uh, cause a heart attack on social media. Right. So stuff like that um, may not happen. But, you know, some of these like middling players, you know, like Ark, who is a very good player, but has, you know, kind of been in the wind a little bit. We could see that over the coming weeks. Um, you know, we've seen we've actually seen it out of the Gladiators coach. Uh, Dipe mm -hmm. has literally done the same thing. Like he said, you know, like I'm, you know, gladiators have afforded me the opportunity to uh, look elsewhere. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of the uh, like just exodus, like um, out of contract type of stuff uh, until probably I would say maybe uh, a month or two. Like when things start getting desperate that's when we're going to start seeing that kind of stuff. So maybe mid-October uh, is when we'll start seeing that, uh, when that first important date comes up. But, um, I, you know, we're going to start seeing a lot of movement. I, I think outlaws are, are primed for some movement. I think we're going to see some movement from Dallas, even though they've confirmed that all their players, except for Node, are already under contract. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that the contracts can't change, and it doesn't mean that they can't add people. So obviously... That's going to change, um, you know, another team that a lot of people are talking about is Florida. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of movement out of Florida just because of the fact that they seem to have already done most of that. Like, we may see a pickup here or there or they like a release. all the cheaper Korean players. Right. So, uh, I, I, I think that's the thing, um, you know, Spanky Hunter in our chat said that, you know, Houston has already dumped its coaches. I fully expect Houston to dump a lot of its players. Uh, I had this conversation with many houston fans at the event and many of them didn't like what i had to say because i'm like <laughs> look at the end of the season you're probably going to keep dante you're probably going to take keep muma and you're probably going to keep linkster uh and beyond that and sefi man yeah, maybe but be, <laughs> beyond that yeah you're you're on the chopping block so mm -hmm. i you know, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks. Uh, I think, out of out of respect, I'm sure they were like, let let the hype die down a couple of days before you really start digging into it. So, uh, we'll give it about a week. Yeah. So, so outside of that, really, the only other movement we saw uh, was I know like Fusion dropped their partner streamers, so they dropped Iman and uh, Kabahi. Uh, yeah. And I, I know, like, not a lot of teams actually have partnered streamers, but, like, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting, like, that the player options also include, you know, kind of, like, the non-players as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Apparently, um, according to Emong, he's known about this for a while. Mm -hmm. Like, apparently, they were just waiting out the contract or something, and I'm sure Kabaji's was the same way. Um, but you, you gotta make up that money for that $50 million arena somewhere, right? So... Uh, sad, sad to see him go, but it, it seems like it was pretty mutual based off of what Emong has said. I, I haven't seen Kabaji's side of things because I don't really catch his streams because he's um, streams at weird times. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, we'll we'll probably see a lot of that kind of stuff happen. Like there are teams with sponsored streamers, like Atlanta's another popular one with a sponsored streamer. Um, so we'll we'll see how it goes. Right, and uh, it's important to note that we do have a pretty major event coming up with the Gauntlet, which is like the major culmination of the best teams out of contenders. Uh, and all the teams are going to have, you know, scouts on hand for that event. Uh, so, you know, we'll uh, potentially see a lot of potential free agents uh, in regards to that. But, you know, we'll talk more about the Gauntlet probably next week as we draw closer to that event. But I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and just seeing how much Sparkle is just going to decimate everyone in that tournament, or if, you know, ATL Academy can, can make a run, knowing that Gator will be playing on that team after playing in the postseason for the Atlanta raid. So, exciting stuff. So, we do have a little bit to watch, kind of, like, in between, but, you know, then we gotta wait on the World Cup 
at that until February. <sighs> but we'll, we'll see. But anyways, we're here to talk about the Grand Finals. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. Uh, there were, there were a couple of choices that kind of, you know, left me scratching my head. Uh, but, you know, across the board, you know, it's important to note, one, it was the golden boy himself, Choi Hyo Bin, being named the 2019 Grand Finals MVP. Uh, you know, we saw Shock kind of, like, go back to the Bastion May composition that they had been running, which, at the time, in the postseason, only saw 6%. Uh, of team fights, and the shock accounted for you know nearly half of those. And you, the craziest thing to me is the fact that the broadcast itself only lasted for two hours and seventeen minutes. Only about an hour of that was gameplay. Uh, so you have the shock who finished the season on a twenty map win streak, which was second only to that perfect stage that they had. And for this runaway core of the Titans, this was their worst loss out of any of the finals that they have been a part of. So, so let's take a look at, at what transpired. So to, to start off, you know, one of the biggest things was the, the map picks by Vancouver. Now, Vancouver did have the map pick for every single map in the series. Uh, maps 1, 2, 3, and 4. And of course, this was a 4-0. So they opted to pick Lee Shang Tower for map one. Uh, and you know, looking back at map records, here the Titans at ten and two, Shock at six and two. Uh, they chose Eichenwald, uh, which both teams are pretty even on, uh, both only having one loss. Despite, you know, Kane's row being in the arsenal and, you know, the the Titans having that head to head undefeated streak on that particular map against the Shock. Uh, and then you have Temple of Anubis, which was one of the Shock's undefeated maps, uh, which, you know, out of the ones in the pool for, for the Titans was kind of like their middle-of-the-road one. Uh, they definitely played that one the most. So, you know, that one I could... You can kind of make an argument for, uh, but the Shock were undefeated on both Anubis and Hanamura. Uh, for Assault Maps, and then for Escort, they chose Gibraltar, uh, which was the Titans' best Escort map, but another undefeated map for the Shock. And and I know, like, a lot of people, uh, you know, myself included, I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, I, I can understand the mindset of, okay, if the... If we, we take a win, chances are when we come back around, the Shocker just going to pick one of their undefeated maps. But you need to actually put yourself into that position to get to that point. And unfortunately, they just kind of kind of played into the Shock's hand based off of just map win statistics, choosing the Shock's best map in each type. Not really doing yourself any favors on that front. Uh, but, you know, two of the four maps were relatively close. Uh, so let's let's talk about how we opened up and the decision for the Titans on Control Center uh, to opt to run in a Lucio Brigitta to try mm. to counter the Doomfist. Uh, I immediately was like, "There's, there's, there's no way. Like, this is not gonna happen." It was just Funny, one of those I said moments. the same thing in the arena. I was like, "This isn't gonna go well." It's just one of those moments. Like everyone knows how. How devastating Doofus is in the meta. And, you know, teams have tried to, you know, run somber comps. That hasn't really worked. We haven't really seen anyone trying to run Brigida, uh, which th there's kind of a reason for. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, you know, there wasn't enough healing throughput uh, for the Titans. And, you know, they weren't able to really wrestle control away until about 93%, which would put it in one team fight territory in regards to the shock but it was just one of those moments where and obviously the titans came in they had they had a plan did not work um and you know that was like the first major decision that i'm just like okay what the heck is going on especially when you factor in even in like the head-to-head -head between uh twilight and violet there were moments in this series anubis primarily where you would have a violet earning his coalescence when Twilight was 
only at about like 40 to 50 percent of his ult mm -hmm. charge at that point but it was just one of those head scratcher moments just to kick things off right out of the gate and it really was an eye-opener for how this series would pan out yeah i like i said i was i was scratching my head at the brig pick because in theory what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to make it harder for the doomfist uh or the reaper but primarily the doomfist to dive in and get picks the problem is when you run brig lucio um you're kind of you know it, it's hard to describe like you're, you're kind of mixing two win conditions um, like you'd be better off running like the Brig Moira because then you have the throughput of healing and the anti dive. Uh, but the, running the Brig Lucio, mm -hmm. um, the shock just countered it by basically instead of just the Doomfist diving in, um, you you just all collapse, and that's exactly what they did. Like if you watch that first team fight, Sinatra goes in and his whole team is right behind him. So, uh. Honestly, like that part of it confused me because, you know, from a basic level, I didn't understand what their their thought process was because, uh, like I said, I, I I knew the brig choice, what it was supposed to do, but the other choices didn't compound that choice. It was almost like you're picking one character to counter a team comp, and that's not how it works. Um, you need to counter team comp. Um, so. I would, like I said, I probably would have ran the Brig Moira if that's how you wanted to play. But I would, you know, I definitely wouldn't have ran the Brig. And they didn't get the point until they switched to the Moira. And by then they were so far behind that it, it didn't really matter um, at all. Like the shot clearly won the first point. Uh, you know, Troy's gravitic fluxes were on point you know all night but the the first map was ridiculous in what he was able to do with some of those in the way he was able to position so i am you know I, i'm going to talk about it a lot tonight as we go through these games but yeah the the brig head scratching moment was definitely like wait what mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say the Titans did fare better when we moved on to Night Market. Uh, you know, they did get the initial control. They did manage to hold for multiple team fights, and, you know, part of that was due to the ultimate combination between both Janu and Hoxel. Uh, Hoxel's Doomfist definitely had a lot more potency in Night Market as opposed to you know, some of these other maps throughout the series, but it was really Sinatra. Uh, who was really key for opening up a lot of these fights along with Troy Copin. And I will say, like, the biggest difference to me throughout all of this was the the Sigma play between these two teams. Janu was consistently the Titans' weak link through, throughout the playoffs, and uh, it, was a, it was a pretty no noticeable difference between these two teams to compare Janu to Troy Copin just straight up. Uh, now, there were a lot of times when, you know, Sinatra would come in uh, open the fight with, like, two picks. Uh, there were, you know, quite a few occasions where Saul Minsu's Reaper would open up with some pretty big picks as well. Uh, even some team wipes out of the Death Blossoms as well. Uh, but, you know, Night Market was a lot closer. There were a couple of times when, you know, both sides would be trading captures, but the Shock would walk away with the map win, despite some of Saul Minsu's Reaper heroics when all was said and done. So, you know, a 2-0 to start... And then we, we moved on to Eichenwald and the Chandelier Bastion, <laughs> which was uh, kind of kind of a nightmare uh, to, to deal with. Uh, so it's it's always one of those scenes like like you know the, sh the Chandelier Bastion can't isn't real like it, it can't hurt you, but uh, it definitely hurt the Titans in this one. But I was happy to just see like at least we got a close map. It was a good response for the Titans, especially after, like, the Shock just kind of, like, ran through without too much of an opposition. To, so to see, like, the Titans be able to, uh, basically, like, within, I think it was, like, a two-second differential with the with the time banks on the attack, be able to match it uh, was a good sign that this was going to be more competitive. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that did not hold on for long. Yeah, so, like, the, the end of map one was was interesting because the titans did did show some signs of life 
Like we we definitely got to see some combos come out of them, uh, but it, it was purely the shock just clutching it out, and that happened multiple times throughout the day. But uh, yeah, going into Eichenwald, back to the map choice. Like, why wasn't it King's Row? Like, like I said in chat, uh, like there was an audible gasp in the arena because everybody's like, "Oh, it's gonna be King's Row. It's gonna be King's Row. Like, it's gotta be. Like, why would you not pick King's Row?" And then it was Eichenwald. And everybody's like, "Wait, what? Like, yeah. who, who, who picked that?" Yeah. So, so, so shock uh, on King's Row just to make this a pointer eight and five. Right. All those losses were to the Titans. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's exactly what we talked about last week. Like, Shock want to avoid King's Row. Well, they got their wish, <laughs> uh, and they didn't even have to pick it. So it it, it was insane that they picked Eichenwald. Uh, and, you know, they, they talk about it on Watchpoint a little bit. Like, these teams are so close that you kind of play to your comfort picks mm -hmm. more than trying to outpick your opponent. Um, unfortunately, they played to the Shock's comfort picks uh, a little too heavily. But yeah, Eichenwald, we saw, um, you know, Shock come out with the Bastion comp immediately, which is very rare, um, even in this meta, to run Bastion on point A. Uh, unfortunately for the Titans, they did the one thing that you can't do when you're playing against a Bastion comp, and that is to give the Bastion line of sight to the point. Mm -hmm. Um and that that was point A for the shock. Like, uh, as like uh, immediately as soon as Bastion set up in that corner, I turned to the person I was with and I said, "It's over for the Titans." Like because they gave up way too much ground. Regardless of how you're playing around cover, um, once the Bastion is entrenched there with the composition the Titans are running, there was nothing they could do except just die and reset. Um, so you know. Uh, from there, the Shock basically walked it to the end. Like, they played hyper-aggressive throughout pretty much the whole attack round. Like, every time they would get some ground, they would take more ground. If you notice, that was, like, their game plan when they were running Bastion. They did the same thing on Gibraltar. Whenever they would get a point or get, you know, some momentum, the Bastion would be, like, way forward. Like, picking up high ground, picking up, you know, chandeliers at one point. <laughs> uh you know that that was that was their game plan, um, and it, it worked. Like they, you know, I said it last week. It, it's gonna be on the Titans to figure out how to break this Bastion comp. And they, they, even throughout the night, they never really figured it out. Like they would stop it here and there, yeah. and they would push him off the cart or or something like that, or they would use all their ultimates and win a fight, only to lose the next fight. Um, so at, as a whole, the Titans never figured out this Bastion comp. Um, and you know, it, like you, you mentioned, and I already mentioned the chandelier moment was great. Like, um, that was, what is it about Eichenwald that makes players just go, okay, I'm going to do something really crazy. Like if you go all the way back to like Zumba jumping through the window during world cup, mm -hmm. like we've seen like crazy wall ride shenanigans from freaking toby like it, it's it's insane um what players do on ike involved so uh, you know that that was really cool um do you want me to go in like vancouver's attack like when we um, just keep going i i, you I, wanna... I do quickly want to thank gabby for, for for the host we appreciate that uh i i i do think like one of my, the favorite moments that i had was obviously you know they're trying to figure out what to do with rascals pharah uh, and, and their solution for that was, like, you know, Twilight, you know, you're, you're on Anna, uh, you, you deal with it, right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, here's the issue with this. Uh, for one, Twilight wasn't with the team uh, in, in these moments. So anytime that we were playing, playing around the clock tower, uh, you know, Twilight was able to land some shots. You know, he had that pretty sick Bionade, which hit off the tower, splashed onto Rascal. He did dispose of him, but, you know, the res was right there and and came in. Uh, but, you know, the Titans, they, they had a pretty lengthy team fight, And, you know, Soma and Sue, a lot of times, was the cleanup spot for the Titans. Uh, and, you know, Titans, they they made pretty quick work of the street space. And they, they kept pace with uh, the Shock's attack. Uh, but, you know, there there were a lot of moments when Rascal would be the one to clutch it out for the shock. You know, he had some pretty big late rocket barrages to kind of, like, turn the tides there. 
Uh, and, you know, on, on the time pick, you know, Titans just couldn't secure more than, than a tick. Uh, but I did like the defense that the Titans put forward uh, in regards to the Shocks time bake attack, because it's not normally a spot that we see a lot of teams holding, because they were far forward, not so much, like, past the, the initial, like, bridge. Uh, but, you know, it was it was an interesting decision. It was an all-in type strat, though. Like, if, if they lost that fight, it would have been one and done. Uh, so they were at least able to maintain some early stall in the time bank. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, Choi had this pretty clutch graphitic flux. And, of course, you know, you had the follow-up to uh, to close out the run for the shock. But a lot of it, you know, there was, there was a lot of moments where the Titans were kind of, like, undecided on wh what they should focus on. Because I know uh, in the shock's time bank attack, of course, you know, Rascal uh, and Moth got, got behind the team. Uh, you know, running the Pharaoh and the Mercy, and, you know, their their attention was kind of kind of distraught at that point, and, you know, Shock ended up closing it out. Uh, but the, the biggest thing for the Shock is throughout this series, they swapped out their DPS. They were either running Sinatra and Striker whenever they were running, you know, the Doomfist and Reaper, and then they would incorporate Rascal uh, and Architect in, in these other rounds, and, you know, there were times when we would have to see Rascal and Architect kind of, like, switch things up, you know, it didn't completely, uh, eliminate the Doomfist play out of the equation for the Shock, but it wasn't something that they had to rely on, and in Rascal's case, there wasn't a lot to really pressure him in the skies on the Pharaoh throughout this series. Yeah, and that, that was basically the, the Shock strategy, so, you know, when Vancouver came out to attack, they were like, all right, Vancouver's going to run the standard composition. So we're going to stick with the Bastion, but we're going to run Farah because Eichenwald A is probably one of the best Farah points in all of the hybrid maps um, just because they can play around that pillar. So, you know, they, they put the Bastion on the back corner uh, on the high ground, which is not a typical spot where we see teams set up. Um, this is really only the composition that you would do that on mm -hmm. because then you let the far play around the you know the pillar the the big building bastion sits up top and the pharaoh can you know go back and forth if they try to pull off a flank angle so um honestly the only reason the titans got point a in the first place on their very first attack was um just kill order like uh titans were picking off key people and trading them for less important people like you mentioned the whole twilight thing um you know dueling it out uh he, they had to waste the res because twilight basically out dueled a pharmacy <laughs> by himself and almost won mm -hmm. like it was just pure force of will from rascal that they didn't both die there um rascal died um but he was able to take twilight with him at the end uh so uh as we saw the next go around um, it didn't. It didn't quite work out for them, uh, and it, that would be like the story going forward. Was like whenever they would run the Farah, they would try to have Twilight contain him, uh, and this was really the only instance where that somewhat worked for Vancouver. Uh, Titans um, didn't really adjust properly once they saw that uh, Rascal was able to handle Twilight as a pharmacy should be able to handle a single old lady just mm -hmm. lobbing grenades at you. Um, so that was a, a misstep from the Titans, but they, they did, you know, I, I give them credit. Like their, their streets phase, their, their third point attack was very clean. Like they, they handled it very well. Like they, you know, um, eventually the shock switch off of the bastion for streets phase. Uh, but Titans roll through it with enough ultimates um, that they they get up to the upper area uh, to the bridge and then shock switch back to the Bastion, get set up. And this is actually really good from the Titans. They actually set up like a two prong attack with Janu in the castle and then everybody else by the cart so that they're paying attention to the cart while Janu's just like, you know, lobbing Sigma balls in at them. Uh, so they, they don't quite know where to look. And as soon as they turn to look at the cart, Janu sweeps in and hits them with a, like a great graphitic flux, which isn't something I get to say a lot uh, <laughs> because throughout the night, 
his his positioning and his gravitic flexes were all over the place mm -hmm. but um that was one instance so i do give titans like there were very good set plays from the titans which we don't typically see out of them like they're definitely like the brawly team like go in and hammer swinging you know whatever and just try to fight it out um unfortunately um throughout the night the shock were just better at that too like that was the thing like shock were winning neutral fights or fights where they were down in ultimates uh and then going into next fights with more ultimates mm -hmm. so that was that was it so you know vancouver's second attack not really much to talk about they did get like a point and a half but that was more so just the shocks positioning than vancouver actually taking the point like shock just did not want to give up the high ground uh and you know rascal's not gonna obviously fly down and contest uh when people are actively shooting at him <laughs> so that was basically that's like the downside of that comp is um the shocks defensive comp is there's not a whole lot to contest the point without putting yourself in a lot of danger like it's not like um the old days when you had like a diva that could fly down to the point contest and then fly back up um and still live you can't do that with sigma unless he has his ultimate and you don't really want to use your ultimate just to position yourself uh so i i, I was really impressed with both teams on this match like like this map could have easily gone either way um it was just that last minute swap to farah from rascal and you know mercy uh for moth that it, it just caught the titans off guard like they were like all right we're 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 holding the bastion comp back we're holding the doomfist back you know they they were able to circumvent the shock's normal normal attack pattern and then shock was shock to their credit made a change on the fly and said we've got one fight left let's just go to the air and see what we can do uh, and Rascal clutched it out. Like Rascal landed some insane direct rockets during that last fight. So that, and like I said in the first map, that was like the go-to um, for the evening. Is like every time Titans seemed to have it in the bag, uh, somebody from the shock would clutch it out. It wasn't always Rascal. Like there was Sinatra, there was Troy Hoban. Um, you know, it, it was just the the shock continually like refusing to lose. Uh, to the point where the casters actually thought the Titans won that map. Uh, mm -hmm. Because on the screen it said Titans won. The casters said we're all tied up. Like, yeah, that was it, Uber. Yeah, so that that was pretty funny. And then they were kind of like, oh, nope, never mind. Shock, shock won that one. So the, Eichenwald was, was a really good map. It was, like, really close. I, I would say the first map was, was close, too. Um, but Eichenwald definitely could have easily gone to the titans um had rascal not clutched it out so we move into assault uh into temple of anubis and so we have the dps for the shock get in uh swap so we got sinatra striker back in uh, and you know titans under attack they uh they made pretty quick work of point a you, you know they they got it in one fight they rolled into b uh, but you know the the shock start to hold steadily on, on their defense here so they do stabilize uh, with, you know, around three minutes left on the clock. Uh, but, you know, this is, like, you know, typical 2CP. You know, the Titans are able to, you know, deal with some staggers uh, and end up completing the map with a 134 on their attack. Uh, now, Shock, you know, a little bit slow out of the gate on their attack. Uh, I know they had back-to-back -back fights uh, where, you know, really not a whole lot happened there, but they are finally able to break through to capture a but it took them into overtime in order to make that happen but you know as you know with most assault maps uh you know snowball potential is real and uh shock they just barge right in to be the complete the map with a better time bank of 212 <sighs> you you hate to see that but you know snowball <laughs> snowball potential and 2cp is always going to be there despite whatever map changes we do see to that map yeah type. uh now uh with the titan sign big attack the shock's defense does hold pretty strong uh hoxel has a little bit of heroics here on the doomfist finds an opening with a little bit under 15 seconds left on the clock uh, and that opening allows the titans to take the first point uh, but Shock, you know, they are able to hold the second. So, you know, there's a win condition on the field for the Shock. So, worst case scenario, you know, they could get a, dr a draw, basically, if they uh, 
if they don't take the first point, which seemed pretty unlikely even despite, you know, their, their struggles initially. Uh, well, on the Shock's time big attack, no struggles whatsoever. They got a on the first team fight, uh, and, you know, Stryker finds an early pick, and that was basically enough for the Shock to take it into a 3-0 lead into the series. But man, it just, it seemed like no matter what the Titans were going to do, like, they were opting to run a lot of mirrors, which, you know, I, I can understand. Um, but, like, when you when you compare the Doomfists, you know, between Hoxel and Sinatra, uh, statistically it was pretty, pretty one-sided in favor of Sinatra, even with him kind of, you know, getting subbed out more so mm -hmm. than Hoxel, because Hoxel did play the entirety of the series, and really... I mean, let's be real, Titans didn't make any substitutions uh, throughout the nope. entirety of the series. It was only the Shock that did that. Uh, I will say I was happy to see that the Shock didn't try to do any, oh, we're up 3-0, so let's pull off some, like, weird sub shenanigans and, like, throw in the B squad. Even though, honestly, it might have still worked anyways, just with the way that the momentum was going in this series. Uh, but, you know... Really not a whole lot of openings for the Titans on Anubis. But, you know, the the shock turnaround between, you know, their their initial attack and the time bank just going from struggling in, like, back-to-back-to-back -back -back fights to just taking it in one fight on a just spelled doom for the Titans in this particular map. Yeah, this was a really interesting map because the Titans looked really, really good. Um, because they were able to rapidly reposition. Uh, Hacksaw was playing kind of the counter Doomfist a little more, like they were waiting for Sinatra to, to jump in. Um, and then at that point, uh, Somensu would just teleport in the back line and, and clean up. The problem is um, Sinatra got a, a pretty good knockoff uh, during their their initial... Um, I, I, not Sinatra. Sinatra. Uh, Hacksaw got a good initial knockoff, um, and then that led to Vancouver taking A. Uh, and then when they went into B, um, it was really like the Sinatra-Troy Hoban show uh, for Vancouver's first attack uh, onto point B, because every time Hacksaw would go in, like uh, pretty much San Francisco were ready for him. Like they, He would get hit with a rock, and then he would get instantly killed. <laughs> Uh, so it was it's actually really funny to watch from the arena because you would just see like dead immediately. Like mm -hmm. you, you could see the life bars uh, on the sides uh, and it, he'd just be instantly deleted. And you're like, what the heck happened? Because we were watching essentially the same thing as you guys were. Uh, so like we didn't have like a map or anything. It was just funny. Uh, but then one of the times they showed it on, on you know, one of the things uh, and literally he would flank around and they would just all turn around and kill him. So Vancouver, you know, eventually, you know, finished the map, but it was just almost like force of force of will at that point. Like they, they didn't really outplay them. Um, they, they brawled it out late, which is what Vancouver is good at. Uh, but more so I want to focus on like the, the shocks attack. Like you said, they really struggled on point a, uh, because of what I had mentioned earlier, I got a little mixed up, but, uh, that was when Hacksaw was playing the counter Doomfist uh, and really like baiting Sinatra and doing stuff like that. Like they, they, I, I think it was Uber or Mr. X mentioned it. Like Hacksaw would jump in and then go back out, and then San Francisco would wait for that to happen, and it would never happen again. So San Francisco would have to aggress, uh, and it, it would fail miserably. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, I, I haven't mentioned this much so far tonight but a, a big story throughout the night was soman Su's reaper just seemed a little off like he would have really really strong moments um but he would make some really bad decisions like there were multiple times he would death blossom uh there was one on eichenwald where he jumped down nanode in a death blossom straight into a sigma where the sigma is just like cool i'll just take all these shields and then kill you um but the same thing happened here. Like he was on the low ground on Anubis A, no one around him. Yeah, they were all there was like him. A, <laughs> there was like a Lucio like floating past him, and he was like, "Cool, I'm a death blossom now." 
and he death blossomed and they just kind of looked at him and said all right you're gonna die now yeah when it, when it happened i was like yeah you you showed that banner yeah you you really <laughs> taught those stairs a lesson holy cow but yeah his his death blossoms are all over the place um and that's that's kind of what gave shock the advantage going into point b like shock obviously won point a and then they went into point b and this was like a big brain moment for the shock is the shock like slow walked the, it was like the slow fast double cap so they they walked in slow enough that they could take ground but they waited for that respawn timer to reset because uh, if you're unfamiliar with some of the changes they did to cp uh like 15 seconds after you cap um point a the defending team has like almost an instant respawn timer so even if you kill people on like say you speed boost and kill people on point b um they will still instantly respawn um which is to prevent these you know double cap scenarios from being very common but the shock played it at such a pace that once they started getting kills they were kills that lasted you know the full respawn timer um and this was really smart for the shock in I, I encourage everybody to go back and, and watch this, but they did like an Intel insights on this where Sinatra comes from one side and the shock come from main and Sinatra knocks slime off uh, with the doom fist. He doesn't kill him. Uh, but at the same time, striker teleports behind them. Uh, and basically at that point, the Titans literally just back up into striker and striker gets a kill and then race out. And by then, the Titans are so badly positioned that the Shock just walk over them. And that's how they got that double cap. Like, it, you could tell, like, that is what they wanted to do. Like, that was a clear set play. And that was that was really exciting to watch. And then, you, you know, you go into the time bank and stuff like that. Uh, you mentioned it earlier um, that uh, Moth, uh, not Moth, Violet, charged up his coalescence in, like, 28 seconds. <sighs> And they, they did that via, basically, Moth sat there as Lucio on speed the whole time, mm -hmm. did zero healing, uh, and just let uh, Janu's chip damage, uh, you know, hit them enough, and then he would just heal them up as Moira, and that's how they took point A. Uh, so it, it was it was a great map. Like, this, this was another really close map. Like, there was multiple times that Vancouver could have won this. Um, it was just shock. Um and they've done this all season so it wasn't a surprise had better set plays like they they had a, a clear plan going into this like they knew how to counter it um you know at, at one point we saw the shock run may reaper which we we haven't seen a whole lot of in the playoffs like that was the stage four comp um but they they ran that on point a uh it 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 kind of worked initially and then vancouver got very aggressive and was able to topple it but then shock you know had the ultimate so that's how they were able to hold point b so clearly the shock had a clear game plan for anubis and titans even though it was their map pick didn't know how to counter that game plan which and, was uh, a, a running trend yeah exactly when you, when you get to pick all the maps and you lose all the maps uh you obviously were out coached somewhere along the line mm -hmm. uh and you know i gotta wrap it up because this is the last map sinatra played this is the last map we saw the doom fist head to head um you know sinatra finished about a k damage more than hacksaw he finished 33 to 27 in terms of final blows uh and he finished 62 to 56 eliminations and that was with like two less maps Two less maps. It was basically equated to about, I think, 10 minutes less game time. Somewhere around there, like 6 to 10 minutes less game time. So, obviously, Sinatra was doing a lot more than Hacksaw. Unfortunately. Uh, so, this would lead into the fourth and final map, which would be a Watchpoint Trooper Altar. Uh, so, another DPS swap from the Shock, Rascal Architect, back in. Uh, Striker, Sinatra, back to the bench. And, you know, Shocker, like, you know what? Uh, we're going to keep running to me. We're going to keep running to Bastion. That's been our go-to on payload maps. Uh, and, you know, Titans to the credit. You know, they, they were able to secure the, the first team fight. Uh, the, the second fight was, you know, a lot of, a lot of messy follow-up. Uh, but the Shock, you know, they, they do end up securing it. They start to push the cart. 
And, you know, they, they find one opening and they just roll straight into uh, the first objective. And, you know, there, there was a really not a whole lot of resistance in regards to, like, the hangar phase. I know, you know, Troy comes in with another pretty big graphitic flux. Uh, and, you know, the shock look like they're just going to have no struggles. They had four minutes left after they reach a second objective on this map. And, uh, you know, here comes Omen Su. He, he lands a pretty massive Death Blossom to kind of, like, halt the Shock's momentum. But it was only temporarily as the Shock ends up completing with, you know, around two minutes left on the clock. Uh, so, you know, Titans, they come in, and Rascal is back on the Pharah. Uh, and, you know, early on, you know, it kind of, like, halts the first two pushes from Vancouver. Uh, Jonu does manage to, like, kind of, like, clutch things out with, like, under 30 seconds left, uh, which opens up the Shock's defense, and, you know, the Hainer phase went pretty easy for, for the Titans compared to, you know, the first point there, uh, so we, we end up going into, uh, the final point, you know, there's, like, less than 30 seconds left, Architect is back on the Bastion, uh, you know, he is positioned, you have the Amplification Matrix, Basically going uncontested, having the clear line of sight as we had mentioned prior, just like it was an Iken Vault. Uh, and Titans are just losing players left and right here. Uh, and, you know, the Shock just end up holding on. And, you know, the the Bastion comp had, was something that the Titans had struggled against New York in regards to the upper bracket finals. Uh, despite that being, like, one of the comfort picks outside of the Shock, uh, in, in New York's case, but it wasn't, like, their go-to, and they kind of ab abandoned it a little bit more in the upper bracket finals, but they saw more opposition from it against the Shock in the grand finals, and, you know, they, they could not figure out a way to, uh, force him off of that consistently. Sure, they would, you know, get a fight here or there, but it wasn't to the point where they would force out whole swaps, like, wholesale from the Shock, and, you know, credit where credit is due, the Shock, they came in, and I, I don't want to say they just straight out rolled the Titans, but, man, they definitely got outcoached in this series, and, you know, I I hate to see it happen in that fashion, like, I know a lot of people uh, were high in the Shock, I mean, we, we, we picked the Shock to win it, uh, we thought it'd be a little bit closer, you know, I know I predicted 4-2, uh, but it was it was a gut wrenching moment for the Titans. But at the end of the day, you know it's it's a combination of one the shock continue like their tremendous run that they were on. You know they had the second longest map win streak in the Overwatch League that season, uh, second only to the shock's perfect stage, uh, where they didn't drop a single map. Uh, and you know you you had the whole story with like the mixed roster doing well for the shock. You know, we got to see them at their full potential. Uh, you know, we, we don't get to see an expansion team come in and just outright win. So, you know, you kind of... It wasn't like all hail the Korean overlord, just like it was with London in the prior year. So we didn't have the the, the repeat like we saw with uh, the KDP squad. Uh, but, you know, it's just... It, it was a bittersweet moment. I, I wanted to see a, a closer series, or at least more maps in the series... But, you know, considering that we got two pretty close maps out of the 4 in the 4-0, you know, it was it was enough to keep me contested, I will say. I would honestly say, like, uh, outside of the first map, uh, and even the first map I would kind of give it to, I'd say three out of the four were relatively close. Um, you know, Gibraltar could have gone either way had some things played out a little different, but... I mean, looking back at Gibraltar, like uh, the shock ran their their Bastion May Baptiste comp, and they said it on the broadcast. But I, I want to reiterate: the shock have a seventy percent fight win rate when they're running Baptiste. Uh, that's that's impressive because mm -hmm. most compositions hover around fifty to fifty five. So if they're running the Baptiste, you have an issue that you have to work through. Um, you know, like you said, Titans came out strong on defense. Like they, they played hyper aggressive, uh, which is what we wanted to see out of the Titans pretty much all night. Like they held the cart from moving for probably about the first two and a half minutes. Uh, and that was, you know, I, I kind of dogged him a little bit, but uh, Soman Sue was winning key duels in that first, you know, those first engagements. Like he, he would walk in and, and beat, 
you know, rascal one V one. Uh, and then he would go through and, and clean it off. So, uh, that, that was what we wanted to see out of the Titans. Unfortunately, once the shot got on the payload and once they got rolling, the Titans didn't have a good answer until, you know, like you said, point C, uh, and that was just like dumping alts. Like they, they had to dump blizzard. They had to dump supercharger. They had to dump, uh, death blossom just to dislodge them. Uh, that that was the amount of investment that it took to basically get the bash to dislodge from the high ground and kill him. Uh, and then at that point, Shock had more ultimates. Like they they just played the slow game. <coughs> Excuse me. And then whittled whittled the Titans down. And then once the Bastion got the high ground on point C, uh, it was an easy finish for the Shock. Uh, and then Titans come around, uh, and Titans you know, do okay initially until the shock set up in that classic watch point Gibraltar fashion where you just defend that last corner on point A and you have Bastion on the high ground uh, and then everybody else on the low ground. Uh, and, th you know, honestly, the only thing that saved the Titans at this point was a clutch sleep dart from Twilight to sleep Troy Hoban so that Janu could get behind uh, and get enough charge to land a gravitic flux to kill both Choi and then pretty much kill Architect. Like he got him down to like 30 health and then finished him off. Um, but it, it was that sleep dart. Had he not landed that sleep dart, Troy Hoban had positioning, he had support, he had, you know, everything that he needed to take care of Janu. Uh, so good, good on Twilight for that one. Uh, and then, like you said, point, point B went pretty smooth for the titans they they took advantage of the other watch point gibraltar uh trope which is bad split spawns where you basically spawn in front of an opening door of six waiting people that want to kill you mm -hmm. um and that's that's how the titans took point b uh, and then point c was really really rough because this this was like the series in a whole in one point it was up to the titans to figure out this puzzle that was a well-positioned bastion with support and how do we dislodge him? Uh, and there there was nothing they could do. Like, So Minsu would teleport in, and he would just get destroyed or slept or hit with a rock and deleted or, you know, whatever the case was multiple times. And they just didn't have an answer for it. And that, that summed up, like, the whole series for me. Like, it, it, Titans just didn't have an answer for what the Shock were were ready to bring. Um, and like, like I said, as a whole... I was kind of disappointed with So Min Su because he was such a playmaker. It just seemed like the Titans were a little rattled um, throughout the night. Like they just their their shot calling was off. Their their positioning was off. Like the Anubis positioning was really weird. Um, that they were able to get caught out, and then there was some like mix ups with what they were doing. Um, you know, bad alt usage as a whole really dogged Vancouver all night. Like, there were multiple times they would lose ultimates because they would just panic and either use them to no effect or die while they were using them, uh, That which is a major feels bad, man. Uh, but, you know, as a whole, I, I, I hoped the series would have been closer, but I, I'm not upset at how the maps turned out because I think a majority of them were um, competitive. Like, I, I, I don't think Vancouver just rolled over. Uh, I think Shock obviously were the better team. They were the better coach team. Uh, they were the better um, they play team. Like like I said, that there were multiple times when Shock would come out and win neutral fights, which is not something we typically say for the Titans. Like the the Titans don't lose neutral fights. That's why they've been so strong all season is because they can walk into a fight three alts down and come out and win it. Um, unfortunately. The shock just did that better throughout the night. Like mm. there, there were multiple times. Yeah, we uh, also maintain their their old control too. Exactly, uh, and and you know I was I was ecstatic to see Choi Hoban get MVP because we were sitting there talking about it as the game ended, and we were like, oh, man, they're gonna give it to Sinatra because he's the popular guy. <laughs> but I was like, I really want Choi Hoban to do it because he was like low key carrying them the whole night. Like he was the one shutting down so Minsu. he was landing boulders whenever they needed to his gravitic fluxes always secured kills um and then they gave it to him so i was i was ecstatic 
Um, the the guy I went with is a tank player, so he's he was jumping up and down. He's like a tank got MVP, a tank got MVP, and I, I was like, calm down, it's Sigma, it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> he's basically a, a he's he's Roadhog 2.0. He's basically mm-hmm. a fat DPS. Um, but as a whole, like I I wasn't disappointed. Like I I I said it last week, and it, it's really cheesy, but I'll say it again this week. I was happy no matter who won because there were both like both sides had their merits like i love the runaway story um but i love the san francisco shock story because the san francisco shock story is they took a bunch of young kids invested in them trained them put you know a process behind it uh and it it worked uh and you know bren said it on the desk but this just shows that mixed rosters can win championships which up until this point we we had always considered because philly had made it last year um to the finals but then they you know eventually lost lost to korea uh so this was kind of like the you know the moment where they were like okay mixed rosters have what it takes if you if you support them so as a whole i i i i enjoyed the finals i enjoyed the game i wish it would have been a little bit longer but i'm not super disappointed because i did get to go out and get some something to eat and drink afterwards uh and still have plenty of time to make it home and see my kids before they got to bed so as a whole uh i i I don't think I could have asked for a better final other than maybe a little bit closer of a match. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I I, I do want to point out the fact that uh, there was a little bit of tactical crouching going on, which I, which is on, uh, on Twitter from a particular podcaster out there from a certain high noon. (laughs) Yeah. Don't get on, on a, on a younger uh, Titans fan. Uh, definitely go check that out, because uh, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, it turns out, you know, wearing an orange wig really, really brings out the best in people, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, that is not the case at all. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think. All right, all right. First of all, need to work on your form, buddy, because that <laughs> that was like the the worst looking tea bag I think I've ever seen. That looked like a guy failing to do a squat. Uh, while pulling a muscle, um, mm-hmm. but beyond that, kudos to you to actually do it in front of the Titans fan. Because initially the Titans fan looked confused, and then they all started laughing. So, um, props to you, man. Yeah, I'm posting it in the uh, Twitch chat for for those that are curious about but that. I, it, 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 I guess that's a good moment to like. All the fans were really cool, like Titans fans, Shock fans. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a lot of outlaw fans, obviously a lot of Philly fans. Um, all the fans were really cool to one another. Like, hey, you know, there there was a, some fun back in the fourth, like like the teabagging, but it was all a good fun. Like nobody got uh, upset or anything um, that I saw. So I, I, as a whole, I think everything went over really well. Absolutely, and now we uh, we look ahead to the future to the 2020 changes. Uh, again, you know we got the gauntlet coming up uh, next weekend. I think they, or maybe that's the. I'll have to double check the dates. It's coming up within the next week and a half for sure. Uh, but well, we'll keep a close eye on you know any sort of player movement, all of that good stuff. Uh, but, you know, hopefully we'll have a nice trickle going into to BlizzCon. Of course, it's, you know, getting close to that time of the year again, so we'll have plenty to talk about. Uh, you know, we got episode 100 coming up. Uh, we got a couple of announcements coming along with that, both on the podcast front as well as BlizzCon front. Uh, but, you know, it's it's worth noting, like, I, I mentioned this on Twitter, on, on our podcast Twitter, that... Uh, the day of the Grand Finals was our two-year anniversary from our first official episode. Uh, now count, I'm not going to count the preview show uh, that, you know, we did primarily just to get the feet up. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of nice how that aligned perfectly to the date, which was in a no-way plan because none of us would actually know what, what the Grand Finals would be for Season 2. But, like, it was just kind of a, kind of a nice moment seeing how everything just aligned perfectly on that front. Uh, so that being said, I do want to thank, you know, everyone again for, for sticking out with us through, throughout the years. And of course, you know, thank you, Spider, mm-hmm. and of course, our brethren, Slambo, wherever he may be. I know, uh, I know he was in Kansas City, you know, at the Chiefs game here pretty recently. Uh, so hope, hope Slambo is doing well with all, all that, uh, Atlanta money that, that's rolling <laughs> in. We'll see whether or not they break grounds on their $50 million arena. 
Who knows? <laughs> Fifty one million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> they gotta one up him. Literally. Exactly. Cox communication is not gonna take this Comcast BS lying down. Mm hmm. Uh, but with that being said, guys, we are going to close out the show for tonight. It's been a late one. Uh, apologies again. So if you guys want to help us out, the best thing to do is to go leave us a review over on iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you'd like to see, you know, incorporated during the off season. Uh, probably a little bit more shenanigans than normal just because, you know, kind of, uh, I don't want to say it's a lull period, but obviously there's no Overwatch League on until February. So please keep that in mind. Uh... Maybe we'll end up doing a little bit more uh, collaborations, kind of like in-between stuff. Uh, so keep an eye on that front. Now, if you would like to find additional Overwatch-related content, of course, we got Overwatch Recall. That is our Overwatch hub for all things Overwatch, whether it's Overwatch, Overwatch League, Path to Pro, Fantasy Overwatch League, all that good stuff on our website. And then every Sunday, we have the Weekly Recall, which is a listing of all of the prior week's episodes. So to find the latest, be sure to follow Overwatch Recall on Twitter at OWRecall. Now, if you would like to support our podcast network, you can do so a couple of different ways. Uh, we do stream pretty regularly over on Twitch, so any sort of Twitch Prime subs or normal subs on Twitch are greatly appreciated. Outside of that, you know, we also have our Patreon page where we have tiers starting at just $1 a month. So for more information, you can find that at patreon.com slash OWL network so you too can join the likes of our master and above patrons the plays of Bob, Brandon, Jay-Z, Owl, and Kesha in helping our network grow. Uh, still weighed in on, you know, any sort of DJ affiliation on that front but, you know, I'm sure it's going to come at some point just to continue the trend. Uh, but outside of that, Spider, of course, there are a number of different ways how our listeners can get a hold of us so why don't you let them know how they can do that. Sure thing. If you'd like to email the show, you can do so at contact at OWLNshow.com. Uh, you can check out our website, www.OWLNshow.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at OWLNshow. Check out our YouTube. We post all the shows plus various other videos that I work on and, you know, we, we put out throughout the week. Uh, it is www.youtube.com slash Overwatch League Network. Uh, you can come talk to us directly on Discord, discord.me slash OWLNshow. Uh, we're always in Discord talking about Overwatch or random other things. Uh, I know Ed and I are about ready to dig into Destiny 2, so we're on there talking uh, about that. Or drunk but tweeting about Harry Potter. Or drunk tweeting about Harry Potter, where you and I just made fun of him the whole time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, definitely check that out. Uh you can find us on Twitch if you're listening to the audio version. Uh, we do have live shows throughout the week. Uh, you can find it at twitch.tv slash OWLN show. Uh, we are a Twitch affiliate, so you can hit the subscribe button to help show your support for the show. Uh, and if not, you can definitely hit the follow button so you know when we go live. Uh, we have multiple shows throughout the week. Uh, currently, we have two specific shows and then host streams throughout the week. Uh, Monday night is overwatch league network which is what you're currently listening to it normally airs at uh 7 p.m pacific uh then wednesday night we have the variety overwatch show which is heroes never die uh and that is 5 p.m pacific and then as totem mentioned we do have host streams throughout the week so definitely hit the follow button uh a going into the off season those will be much more regular um and then one more time just to throw it back out there patreon.com slash uh, OWL Network, just another way to help support the show. Uh, you can find myself on Twitter at SpiderGD, so if you'd like to see those funny fan fest videos, that is where they will be. Uh, I'll probably post some of them in Discord too, uh, depending on how they, they look. Uh, but where can they find you, Totem? Well, I'm also on Twitter at TotemlyDrunkCTR. Uh, but with that being said, guys, I do want to thank you again for joining us tonight for another episode of Overwatch League Network. This has been episode number 98. I've been your host, Totally Drunk, joined, as always, by my co-host, Spider, and we hope to see you guys back Wednesday for our next episode of Heroes Never Die. Take care, and have a good night.